I went to an unconventional high school. Instead of classrooms, we learned in campsites and hostels. Instead of after-school soccer practice, we went whitewater kayaking. And with our textbooks and our teachers, we traveled to some of the most amazing rivers on Earth. But we weren't the only ones traveling the world in search of rapids. Hydroelectric companies sought them, too. You see, hydroelectricity is generated by water flowing through turbines. The larger the volume of water and the higher the drop, the more energy can be produced. So it's not surprising that wherever we went to find big rapids, we found big dams, too. I'd always been taught that hydroelectric development was a good thing. Every environmentalist dream, clean, renewable, and probably our best bet to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. But in 2010, I went to Chile with my high school, and my Chilean Spanish teacher, Lorenzo, told us of the battle his family and his town were facing. In the Maipo River Valley, an environmental movement was protesting against a mega hydroelectric project. Now half built, the Alto Maipo project intends to divert 80% of the river through over 100 kilometers of underground tunnels. That's huge. This is also the river that supplies the capital, Santiago, with the majority of its potable water. And it's already stressed because of many years of consecutive drought. It is thought that this project will further threaten that supply of water. The No Alto Maipo campaign was the first of many social and environmental movements I saw that opposed hydroelectric development. In fact, it seems that every river I paddle today has either been recently fragmented by a dam, or there is a major project proposed to do so. This is the White Nile in Uganda. In 2011, I paddled the legendary Silverback Rapid and the Bujigali Falls that are sacred to the Basoga people. We were some of the last paddlers to run this section before it was dammed and flooded in 2012. I remember one morning, Lorenzo wanted us to see the rapid from land. So we walked down the main road and stopped at a lookout over the river. Almost immediately, we were held at gunpoint by guards who thought that we were trying to take pictures of the controversial project. You see, the goal of the dam was to produce cheap electricity. But just as experts predicted, the project costs twice as much as expected, and the electricity it generates is so expensive that most Ugandans can't afford it. By flooding the famous rapids, diminish the local river tourism. By creating a stagnant reservoir, it increased the malaria of the region. Rust and cracks are already forming in the structure, so it's unlikely that it will live to see its 50-year lifespan. And even though the levels of the White Nile are steadily declining because of dam releases and because of climate change. And even though the reservoir is quickly filling with sediment trapped by the wall, the government deemed the Bujigali Dam a success, and they want to continue. In 2018, they will begin filling the next dam reservoir on the White Nile. And when I go there again this January, I will say goodbye to another beautiful section of whitewater. The more I traveled, the more I saw this story of conflict and controversy surrounding hydroelectric development repeating itself, regardless of country or continent. I listened to these stories wherever I went, speaking with indigenous communities, campaign leaders, hydroelectric project managers, engineers and politicians. I wanted to understand what was going on. So in 2014, I went to Bolivia, and I met Jacinta. Jacinta is an Amazonian woman who lives on the banks of the Beni River, a tributary to the Amazon. Here, she is showing me how high the water rose in her house during the 2014 floods. It was the largest flood in living memory but it was not due to natural causes alone. The water rose that high because over 150 miles downstream in Brazil, the two dams that had just been completed were not prepared for an abnormal flood year. 
So the reservoir is backed up, causing flooding in Bolivia that was far worse than if the dams had not been there at all. A brutal irony, considering that they were advertised to control flooding. But the shocking part of that story is that the company knew of the risks ahead of time, but disregarded them for fear of jeopardizing their profits. People like Jacinta were not warned. This is not the first time that mega hydroelectric projects have resulted in privatizing their profits and socializing their costs. There are 10 more hydro projects proposed on Amazon tributaries in Bolivia. If built, they will force the relocation of over 60 indigenous communities and will inundate over 2,000 square kilometers of Amazon rainforest. If these projects come to fruition, Jacinta's home will be one of the first to be flooded. If you think of the Earth as an organism, rivers are the figurative veins of our planet. And like our blood, the water that flows through them has many purposes. It gives us water to drink, to irrigate, to recreate, fish to eat. It also keeps our oceans healthy by bringing nutrients down to the coasts, feed coral reefs in coastal life. It regulates regional climates and hydrological cycles. It can even sustain forests hundreds of miles away. Rivers are so much more than the squiggly lines you see on maps. They are a coalescence of life itself. And while the water that flows through them is renewable to a point, the rivers themselves and all the services they provide are finite resources, and we need them to be intact. Because humanity is facing a very serious reality. By the middle of this century, the global demand for fresh water is expected to exceed supply. But we're not seeing that. When it comes to hydroelectric development today, we're not just blocking veins and capillaries anymore. We are literally cutting off our arteries, building mega dams on the mightiest rivers in the world, the Amazon, the Nile, the Yangtze, and the Congo. And we are going bigger and bigger every time. Let me show you. This is the Hoover Dam. At the time, it was the largest concrete structure in the U.S. and was considered one of the seven man-made wonders of the world. That was in 1936. You can't build a dam like this in the U.S. today because doing so would violate so many environmental and social regulations. This is the Three Gorges Dam in China. In 2012, it was completed on the Yangtze River. It is five times bigger than the Hoover Dam. The weight of its reservoir alone has the capacity to slow the rotation of the Earth. It is so heavy that the region has experienced a 30-fold increase in earthquakes since pre-dam times. That's scary, especially when you have millions of people living in the floodplains beneath the dam. And it doesn't stop there. There's a bigger project planned. The Grand Inga Hydroelectric Project, proposed on the Congo River, the second largest river in the world by volume. The Grand Inga Project will be twice as big as the Three Gorges Dam. And its construction is planned to commence before social and environmental assessments are completed. We are building these mega structures in an attempt to treat the symptoms of disease our society is facing. Symptoms like energy shortages, resource depletion, and an addiction to fossil fuels. But the way we are going about this treatment is wildly experimental. And it's outdated. It's like using leeches to treat a life-threatening illness. 
It maybe sounded brilliant in the 1300s, but we have antibiotics now, which can be compared to more sustainable energy sources, solar, wind, geothermal, tidal. And if we really want to fix things, we're not going to overuse antibiotics, and we're certainly not going to cover ourselves in leeches. We're going to look into preventing the disease. How can we reduce energy demand and consumption so we don't have shortages? How can we conserve our resources and maintain a balance on Earth? Mega hydroelectric development is not helping us to do that. In fact, the evidence indicates that it costs society more money than it's worth, and that it causes more problems than it solves. I'm not saying that all dams are bad all the time. Like leeches, they do have limited uses in certain contexts and on small scales. But we need to change this notion that says bigger is always better. Unfortunately, some countries are beginning to see that. Take the U.S. for example. In just three years from now, almost 90 percent of our 90,000 dams will be past their functional lifespan. We are investing enormous resources in either renovating or demolishing these outdated dams. And restoring rivers in an attempt to undo some of that damage. And then look at Chile. Almost every river in Chile has a hydro project proposed on its back. And yet, in 2014, after seven years of campaigning in the biggest environmental movement Chile had ever seen, the government rejected the $10 billion hydro Sen project that would have put five mega dams in the Chilean Patagonia. And in July of this year, the Alto Maipo project, the project that opened my eyes to the conflict seven years ago, lost its funding to complete the underground tunnels. For the first time ever, projects are being re-evaluated because of increased awareness and because of pressures on stakeholders. We're taking a closer look not only at the cost versus the benefits, but a closer look at who is bearing the cost. What places will shoulder the impacts? And who and how many will enjoy the benefits that were promised? We don't have to wait until we've severed all of our veins and all of our arteries to realize that we're losing something precious. We need to protect rivers now more than ever so we can continue receiving all that they offer us. There are many ways to generate electricity, many ways to develop nations responsibly, but the best way to protect the rivers that hold our most cherished resource is to keep them free. Thank you. <laughs>